we are on in three, two, and one. No news is good news with Gary Ganu. Via Allegra, la 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 la, la 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 la, Allegra. Awesome. Welcome to episode one twenty one of Nerdery and Murdery. One twenty one. I'm Zig with your Nerdery, and I'm Jeffrey with your Murdery, and we have Guestery in the house again. We have Keith who's joining us for another week. Welcome back. Thanks. Happy to be here. Two weeks Thanks. in a row. So awesome. Um, I don't have a lot uh, major going on. I did uh, uh, finally dive into She-Hulk. Uh, I've got two episodes left of that to go. It's fun. It's campy. Yeah, that's it's why great. I like it. Love that but, show. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I I I found it interesting. It's it's it. Uh, I didn't really know what to expect for it, but it's been it's been pretty interesting. I love. Uh, Tim Roth. Tim Roth is great. Uh, yeah, Thanks, Tim. Keith. Yeah, he's he's great. I I love him as an actor, and he's just been really good in this. I, it's it's been really cool. So wanted to get all the, get, get all those watched. Uh, you know, I we've got uh, the Marvels hitting the theater next week. So trying to get all 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 caught up before before that comes out because I'll probably see that on opening weekend. I'm I'm looking forward to that wait waiting for loki to end so i can binge watch that uh yeah it's really good <laughs> yeah i watched season i watched episode one of loki season two but i'm saving the rest of them it's really good I'm really enjoying that one awesome I, I like that they got a lot of people from uh, lovecraft country are showing up in that uh in that series oh i don't i don't know uh, yeah it's it's really nice don't know any of those people, so I couldn't say yes or no on that. You should check out Lovecraft Country. It's really good. What is Lovecraft Country? I want to say it was HBO did a series. Yeah, it was HBO. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, a couple of years ago. Yeah, based based on a novel that I think may have been a bestseller. Sadly, off the top of my head, I don't know the name of the author. Uh, but yeah, good book and good show. And... Um, uh, ironically, the main character in uh, Lovecraft Country was played by the actor, the same actor who plays Kang. Yes, uh, and John, he, Jonathan Majors. Yes, yes, thank you. And I think that it was Lovecraft <clears throat> Country that sort of propelled him into the visibility that got him that Kang role. Yeah, um, well, yeah I have not but... been keeping up, so I don't know if he's going to continue to be Kang or if they're going to no. phase Kang out. Or nope, they've booted. Well, we don't know if they're going to phase Kang out. They've booted Jonathan Majors. Yeah, uh, because of his uh, his issues, and uh, he has issues. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he's he's been. I don't remember what it is that he's accused of. He's been a bad boy. He's been yeah, a bad boy. I knew yeah. that. Is it assault? Uh, yeah, I think it's sexual harassment or sexual assault. I'm not. Yeah. Oh, wow. So he won't be a part of it. That doesn't mean Kang's not going to be because. Oh, they just recast Kang. Yeah, sure. They just recast him. Which, sure. with if the you variance, think about sure. Kang, that's a particularly easy role to recast, right? Right. Yeah. Because he could look like anything across the multiverse right that's right so yeah so don't know if they're going to continue they, there's no word really if they're going to continue on but there's rumor that it's possible they may switch over to dr doom which that excites me more yeah. sure well i mean dr doom is an iconic marvel villain kang is kind of like a i don't know like a b-side guy to me yeah. right you right. know i i've never been that you know i, I think that they kind of uh fumbled the ball a little bit with the introduction of the main villain for this next phase. So it's far like they we went have. From, yeah. It's like we went from Thanos to this guy, mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, but you know, whatever. Well, and not a lot of, not a lot of people are, are understanding of yet just how powerful Kang can be. Yes. Sure. I mean, so, I get that. So, but, uh, but if we can, bring in doom then that'll generally then that that will most likely signal the reboot once again of the fantastic four yes. oh my god yes it would have to and that'll be what the fourth movie uh the third re the third iteration because you had the first one with two movies and then you had the reboot and then 
going on to this this next one so so it'll it'll be interesting to see how it goes so anyway uh zig i will let you take us over to the nerdy side of the house all right well today we're going to talk about uh 10 kid shows that you've probably forgotten about what'd you say keith i said i love the nerdy side of the house (laughs) well thank you sir (laughs) <laughs> uh, so today we're going to talk about uh, Via Allegra, uh, Las Carascalindas, Electric Company, Great Space Coaster, Zoom, Starcade, Giggle Snort Hotel, oh Danger God. Mouse, Dusty's Treehouse, and Pinwheel. Most of them I'm familiar with. So I need to borrow the pod for just a minute. It's the late 70s. Um, in the morning, and I've watched. I'm a small child. I've watched Sesame Street. I've watched um, Mr. Rogers, The Electric Company. There's one more show I'm going to watch before I go outside and play. I thought it was one show. It turns out it was actually two made by the same PBS station. <laughs> it was Via Allegra and Carascalindas. They were on at the same time. They were produced by the same PBS station, but in two different cities. So originally, um, I need to make sure I get this right. Uh, The PBS station for San Antonio and Austin was shared. Um, It was KLRN. Um, and, and it was on in the University of Texas campus, but they were they wanted to put it basically in between San Antonio and Austin, so they centered it in, um, I believe, New Braunfels. Um, but they didn't get both areas completely, so eventually San Antonio got its own station and Austin got its own station. But if you're sort of in between, you can catch them both. Keith might be able to speak to this. You have two PBS stations down there, correct? So the one that I'm familiar with is uh, KLRU, which I assume is the one that moved to the to UT when the when they split into two different stations. Yes. Uh, KLRU is uh, you know everywhere up here is and it's the only one that I ever hear anything about. Of course, I'm sure you know San Antonio is a bigger city than Austin. It's like I don't know the third biggest town in the state now. So I'm sure they have their own uh, PBS station. And that's probably the case. They probably kept the call sign KLRN. KLRN. That is correct. Um, but yeah, I, I'm never down there, you know, watching or listening to, you know, public radio, public television. So I couldn't really speak to that half of it, but yeah, KLRU is definitely broadcast from the UT campus that's always headquartered on the UT campus. And in the 20 years that I've lived here now, that's, that's all I'm, I've ever been familiar with. Right on. Well, okay, so back in the in in the seventies, in the early seventies, um, if you were a kid in the seventies and you watched public broadcasting in your town, you may not you may not have come across a very different kind of kids show, where the characters spoke both English and Spanish. The original idea for both of these shows, both Via Allegra and uh, Carascalindas, or Los Colas, Los Carascalindas. Sorry, my Spanish is terrible. Um, They taught Spanish to Anglo kids and English to Hispanic uh, uh, Hispanic kids. So the idea was, much like Dora later on, the kids who spoke mostly Spanish learned to speak English, and the kids who spoke mostly English learned to speak a little Spanish. And didn't Electric Company also do that? Yes, Electric Company did do that. Um, They wanted to teach people Spanish as well as, I think, some French and some other languages as well. Oh, interesting. But... uh, these two, these two, uh, these two shows were being supported by the same group. Um, it wasn't uh, the Children's Television Workshop. It was a different group altogether, um, which eventually lost funding in the early '80s. But um, so, like with Via Allegra, it was the first national bilingual. Uh, Spanish-English program in the United States, produced by Bilingual Children's Television, which was different from the Children's Television Workshop, and its inaugural, its inaugural project on the company founded in 1970 was Via Allegra. 
Uh, it debuted on PBS in 1973 and ran there until founding uh, funding disputes ended the project in 1981. So we lost the funding for the bilingual children's television, and most of it went to the children's television workshop, which is what does Sesame Street and Electric Company and things of that nature. Uh, the show was also shown in syndication on commercial stations in some markets or at least on a weekly basis. Now, the thing was, when I was a kid, I thought both of these shows were the same thing. So, so from inside the foreboding-looking multi-story windowless studio, they produced Las Carascalendas, um, <clears throat> which was very bright and very uh, – it was like a little Spanish village or a little Mexican village or a border village. Um it ran from 1970 to 1976, uh, and it ran in reruns in our local market uh, until about 1980. Um, it was the brainchild of Austin's Ada Bar Barrena, Barrera, I am so sorry, uh, who started her public TV journey in 1962 when she hosted bilingual education, show, education shows that beamed across schools in Texas. Barrera said that she wanted to create something more – uh, an enjoyable, fast-paced television show that mixed Spanish and English songs and dialogue and featured a cast of unforgettable characters. The same with Via Allegra. So as a child, I'm sitting down, I'm watching this show. I thought the show was called Feliz Navidad because I was a young idiot. Was. Yeah, I, I don't know why. How about is? <laughs> Well, he's not I'm, young anymore. That's right. Yeah, I'm 50 yeah, now. So. <laughs> he's an old idiot. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. But, yeah, I can re – the Via Allegra song stuck out in my mind, and that's what started me down this rabbit hole. It's like, how did the, what was that show? Cause, and I was looking up – again, looking up Feliz Navidad about six months ago. <laughs> la, 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 Allegra. And I'm like – I'm pretty sure that called... was the theme to the Smurfs that you just sang. <laughs> no, it's the theme. Go to our YouTube playlist. You will, la, 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 you will get the opening to Via Allegra. Via Allegra. La, 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 Allegra. And if so, the, spurt, the Smurfs ripped this off because this was from the early 70s. But anyway, in, in – The Spurts. The Smurfs ripped them off. <laughs> so in the 70s and the very early 80s, our local PBS station, KERA, ran these shows back to back. Um, but Via Allegra means Happy Village. Uh, it's it was a children's television show that was, and it was the first national bilingual Spanish English program in the United States. I think Via Allegra actually went out just before Las Cal uh, the other show, because I can't pronounce it right, Carscalendas. Um, but again, here they showed them back to back. So they're beaming out of the same PBS station, but one is filmed in San Antonio and one is filmed in Austin. And eventually those two stations split. You get KLRN in San Antonio and, as he said, KLRU in Austin. Um, but eventually they lost their funding. Now they did show this on syndicated uh, shows or syndicated television stations for a long time afterwards because it filled their credit for educational programming. Um, it was really good. Uh, great songs, great episodes, and you got to learn a little Spanish too while you were at it or English. But this was a, this was a big, uh, this was a big one for me. And, and for a long time, no one knew what I was talking about. Probably didn't help that I didn't realize it was two shows and I was giving it the wrong name. Yeah, and it wasn't called Police Navidad. Yes, yes, which so, is Merry Christmas. <laughs> I, I, sort of an interesting coincidence here, if I can interrupt for just a second. No, no, please. Um, because I, I suspect that this is going to play into your overall narrative for this show. Um, I did a term paper um, in college about the deregulation of children's television programming and how the Reagan administration... You remember Schoolhouse Rock? Oh, yes. You guys done. have done an episode on yep. Schoolhouse yes, Rock. Yes, we have. Yes, we have. Yeah. So uh, Schoolhouse Rock, w the reason that it, you know, lar that it existed was because there was this mandate by the government, to, I believe by the FCC, 
that uh, a, cer a certain number of hours of television be devoted to educational programming. Mm -hmm. The Reagan administration came along in, you know, 1984 or something and said, uh, yeah, we're not going to do that anymore. You know, broadcasters should be free to, you know, broadcast whatever they want when they want, and they deregulated it. Mm -hmm. And and then suddenly you no longer had shows like Allegra and the Electric Company and Schoolhouse Rock, and they all got replaced with shows like He-Man. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and so I, I suspect that that will play into your narrative some. But anyway, I just wanted to tell you, it was interesting that, uh, you know, I have some familiarity with the sort of the the behind the scenes machinations that, you know, of what uh, what you're talking about here. Keith, I would like I would like to thank you for bringing that up because that was my next point. Oh well, I just got it. Was sorry. No, 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 no. It's fine because you actually explained it better than I had it written down here. <laughs> so, yeah, basically there was this deregulation, which which we eventually got back, um, which is why Saturday morning cartoons are all educational information shows now. Um, I prefer to blend. Um, I, I think we should have some entertainment as well as some education. It doesn't necessarily all have to be, you know, wild kingdom. Um, the, the next show I would like to talk about, however, um, playing along with that was from children's television workshop. It was an American educational, uh, children's television series called the electric company. It was by the same people that did Sesame street, but it was co-created by Paul Dooley Joan Gantz Cooney, and Lloyd Morissette. The series aired on PBS for 780 episodes over the course of its six seasons from October 1971 to April 15, 1977. The program continued in reruns until uh, October 4, 1985, and the electric company later reran on Noggin, a channel co-founded by the CTW from 1999 to 2003. Noggin also produced a compilation special for the show. The workshop produced the show at, at Reeves Teletape Studios in Manhattan, um, which was like right next door to the Sesame Street set. Uh, it employed sketch comedy uh, and various other devices uh, to provide an entertainment program to help elementary school children develop their grammar and reading skills. My favorite was they had Spider-Man. Yes. I was about to say, and oddly, you know, kind of uh... – Separate from all the other thing they would do, they would do on that show. Uh, Spider Man would pop yes. up. Yes. Would, yes. But if you'll remember, Spider Man never spoke. He only spoke in word balloons. So it forced you to read it in the same way you would read a comic book, and that's um, what they were trying to go for. Interesting. Was, okay. Was, was the electric company? Did, did the electric company? Was was that the one that had the? The Bill Cosby drawing to a that was story. Picture pages. Picture pages. Wasn't that? Was that a no, part no, no, of no. Electric Company? No, no. Picture pages was a separate thing. He was with Electric Company their first couple of seasons. Okay. Um, be, it, because he was basically using it uh, as a way to get as a way to get his uh, doctorate in education. Um, as soon as he got his doctorate, he left and started Picture Pages and Fat Albert and stuff like that. Gotcha. But originally, the original cast included Morgan Frieda, Freeman, yeah, Rita Moreno, that. Bill Cosby, Judy Grabart, Lee Chamberlain, and Skip Hannett. Um, and eventually they got a few other people. Uh, I really, really liked uh, The Electric Company. Again, it was geared – so Sesame Street's for preschool children, you know, two to five. Electric Company was like five to ten. Mm -hmm. um, so it kind of hit me a little bit better in the – more in our – wheelhouse at the time um cosby and moreno uh, were already well-established performers on film and television ken roberts best known for soap opera announcers uh love of life and the secret storm was the narrator of some segments during season one most notably the parody of the genre that had given him prominence love of chair uh the spider super stories were short pieces debuted during season four and featured spider-man played by Danny Seagram from 74 to 77. Foiling petty criminal, Spidey was never seen out of costume as his alter ego, Peter Parker, right. and he spoke in speech balloons for the audience to read. A spinoff comic book, Su Super Spidey Super Stories, was produced by Marvel Comics from 74 to 81. Hmm. Um, so yeah, yeah, the, the thing about the Electric Company, which most of us really loved, is it was the 
really kind of the first time you got Spider-Man on television. I, oh, yeah. Yes, yeah, there was a cartoon in the 60s. It didn't run very long. We had the TV movies on CBS, which were not great. Uh, and the Japanese had uh, Speedro Man, which we never got over here. Well, there was a live action Spider Man TV series. I don't remember how long it lasted, but yeah, it was. Uh, they were basically they were TV movies that ran on CBS. There I were, I think, they, six I thought of they them. were weekly episodes. Mm -mm. No, they were they were little TV movies. What they would do is they would break them down into into cliffhangers. So hmm. it, it was like a series, but it it really wasn't. We had that huh. live action Spider Man. What I what I suspect is they probably took those six movies cut them up into little chunks so that they could syndicate them as a series. And that is exactly probably, what they did. And that's probably what Jeff's thinking of. Yes. Um, where he was, he was walking up and down the walls like this and you could see the, the, yeah. the cable pulling him up. <laughs> and for some reason, instead of having a white, and it probably just cause I couldn't figure out how to do it. Instead of having white eyes, he had metal T strainers. Yeah. Uh, for his eyes, which was off putting, but Again, the thing about Electric Company is it, it brought Spider-Man, and, and the idea was it wasn't the character. They were trying to get kids into reading the comic book, so it was, uh, as Keith pointed out, we need to get some education into children, and one of the ways to educate them is to get them to read more, so it was really nice. The next series I want to talk about is The Great Space Coaster. So, so – what this was this was a favorite of mine mm -hmm. um when it was on i couldn't get it because we were in wichita falls oh. and our pbs i don't even remember if our pbs station was wichita falls or lawton uh but actually i'm sorry it wasn't even pbs we we, we it wasn't pbs sorry refer it let me back up we didn't get great space coaster on our tv stations in wichita falls but when i would come to visit my mima in fort worth got it on channel 39 yes and so that was just that that was one of the things i really enjoyed is mima would make breakfast and then i would sit in the living room with my tv tray and my breakfast watching the great space coaster because it was awesome. Yes. Um, it was a first-run syndication show, and it ran from 1981 to 1986. Uh, the series was co-created by Kermit Love, who was original Muppet designer and builder for Jim Henson, and Jim Martin, who later went to work on a number of Henson-related projects, including Sesame Street. <clears throat> the series episodes were videotaped in New York City, where were directed by Dick Feldman, and were – Fitted with a laugh track. It was produced by Sunbow Productions and distributed by Claster Television, a division of Hasbro. Um, another interesting side note to that, this is where Kevin Clash got his start. Uh, Kevin Clash, most famously known for being the voice of Elmo and the puppet maker of Elmo. Kevin Clash I, is really big with Sesame Street now, but he actually started with Kermit Love. On the great I, th space I think the Great Space Coaster was the input was the inspiration for the Daily Show. You think so? Because of Gary Ganu. Gary Ganu. Yes. Yeah. Well, if you if you watch the early versions of the Daily Show with um, Craig Kilborn. Craig Kilborn. Yeah, I get that. The set even looked the same. No Ganus with is is good Ganus with, with Gary, Gary Ganu. Ganu. Uh, so the Great Space Coaster is actually about three young singers, Francine, Danny, and Roy, who are brought to a habitable asteroid in space called Coasterville by a clown named Baxter, who pilots the Space Coaster, a roller coaster-like spaceship. The asteroid is populated by strange-looking, wisecracking puppet characters such as uh, Gorilla Gorilla, Knock Knock the Woodpecker, Edison the Elephant, and Gary Gnu, host of the Gary Gnu Show. Uh, Baxter is forever on the run from M.T. Promises, a nefarious ringmaster who plans to recapture ba Baxter and return him to the circus he worked at before he escaped. Each episode ends with a different life lesson and very celebrity guest stars such as Mark Hamill of Star Wars fame and composer Marvin Hamlish occasionally drop by. Marvin Hamlish was on the show a lot. Yep. I think he was on practically was every episode. Yeah. 
Uh, in every episode, Roy shows a short film on his portable fold-up television. Most often, the segments came from La Linea, an Italian animated series about a little man who is drawn using a single line at the beginning of the segment and then springs to life. Communication with his animators through high-pitched Italian mixed with gibberish. Other animated shorts from the National Film Board of Canada, Westwood Studios, and Jim Thurman. So all this was going on in in the little great space coaster. Keith, did you ever, were you, were you a fan of this show? So I, uh, it's like when you, at the top of the episode, when you said great space coaster, it's like that ping, that fired some long dormant neuron in my brain <laughs> that I haven't thought about for, you know, 45 years or something. Yeah. 81 sorry. to 86. So yeah. Yeah. Sorry. My, my cat has an important message. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you can hear her right behind me. Uh, anyway, so yeah, I uh, I don't remember Great Space Coaster, but I do remember that Gary Gnu tagline. Yes. So clearly, at some point, I was watching this show, or you know, whatever. But yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's it's like not part of my, you know, childhood lexicon at all. It, it doesn't. It, it's not. It's not. It, it's it's firing a neuron, but not more than yes. say two or three. Right on. Okay. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Precisely. Yes. And, and wish your cat well, please. Okay, we'll do. Thanks, Lady Bird. <laughs> Lady Bird. Oh, what a great name for a cat. Yeah. The next show we're going to talk about is Zoom. So Zoom was actually brought back in the early 2000s. Um, and it actually did a little bit better than it did the first time. But Zoom is a half-hour educational television program created almost entirely by children. It aired on PBS originally from January 9th, 1972 to February 10th, 1978, with reruns being shown up until September 12th of 1980. It was originally produced by WGBH Boston and inspired by educational shows like Sesame Street and The Electric Company, but designed to give the kids who watched it a voice without adults on the screen. It was for the most part unscripted, far from seeking to make stars of their child performers – the contracts prohibited them from making any television appearances or doing commercials for three years after they left the show. Uh, the show was revived in 1999, and they aired on PBS until 2005. Uh, on the show, a cast of a cast of seven kids, uh, ten in the season four, known as Zoomers, presented various activities such as games, plays, poems, recipes, jokes, movies, and science experiments, all suggested by viewers. Uh, uh, or contributions from the viewers. These activities were introduced by such titles as Zoom Movie, Zoom Play of the Week, Zoom Game, Zoom Do, Zoom Goody, Zoom Phenomenon, etc. The cast all had uh, informal chats on subjects such as hospitals, school, family, and prejudices titled Zoom Raps. Each episode ended with a choreographed song performed by the cast. So the thing I remember most about Zoom were the shirts. Every episode opened with them with these little rugby jerseys with striped shirts. I remember and they would do singing and dancing in these striped jersey shirts and jeans. I had to look it up. I remember the logo for Zoom, but I just don't remember this show. Uh, it was uh, – I went back and we should have – I think we've got a full episode of it in our YouTube playlist as well as some of the openings. And I ended up including some of the stuff from the new revised version. But yeah, this is one of those ones that was um, – that I seem to remember everybody watched because when I showed them a picture of the kids in the, uh, the, the rugby jerseys, they remember it. But that's all they remember about it. Uh, that and some was people it also look, PBS? Yes. Most so of the stuff my, I got is PBS. Yeah, my recollection is that it was like a block of it was like Sesame Street and then Electric Company and then Zoom, yeah. kind of all on a block. And like you said earlier, it's like Sesame Street is the preschool show, and then you know, uh, uh, excuse me, Electric Company is like the elementary school show. Yes. And in my mind, Zoom was again a progression past that, which it may not have been. But you no, know, I think you're correct. It's mostly uh, preteen kids and yeah, teenage was, kids. Yeah, yeah like mid, uh, like middle school. So it's like you had your preschool show, your elementary school show, your middle school show. Yes. And if you were in Canada, you got Degrassi for the high schoolers. So. Oh, nice. <laughs> 
Um, but yeah, so so Zoom was uh, it was based around these kids putting on this production. There was also a mail and request became a pop culture reference for for musical exhortations to write Zoom Z double O M box three five O Boston Mass O two one three four and send it to Zoom. The lines were all spoken, but the zip code was sung. The O two one three four. And in the opening sequence, each cast member performed a brief signature move. Uh, the second season cast member Bernadette's arm thing, a helicopter-like series of arm moves, became famous among the show's young audience. So, and she actually went on to an episode a few years later to show them how to do the arm thing. I cannot remember it. It's something like this, and it's terrible. But I have a video of it in our playlist if you want to see it, where she explains how to do the arm move thing. That's about it for Zoom. I, again, there's not a lot of information on it other than, uh, as you said, it's mostly for middle school kids. So something interesting, just a historical footnote. The zip codes were pretty new at yes. that time. So the singing the, the zip code specifically was probably to teach kids about this newfangled thing that, the, that you're supposed to use when you write a letter now yes. called the zip code. The zip code. Yeah. Which, you know, basically put it in the proper uh, – each zip, I think this is correct. Each zip code is assigned to a post office, a location. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah. And then so all of the – everything with that zip code goes to that location. And so even if you're close, you'll be within – you know, I may have got the zip code wrong, but it's going to be within a specific area of that post office. So. Yes. A, it was a huge leap forward for like automation and yes. workflow management of the at the time massively growing, uh, you know, post office. System. Yes. The next the next series I want to talk about is Starcade. God, I love Starcade. I I wanted to be on Starcade so bad. <laughs> Starcade is an American game show where contestants competed against one another by playing arcade video games. The series originally aired on WTBS from 1982 to 1983, followed by a run in syndication for the following season. So this show only ran two seasons. Mm -hmm. I remember it being on longer. Mm -mm. Am I crazy? Yes. Yeah, okay. well, besides that, yes. <laughs> I mean, it definitely had an outside an outsized footprint for our generation. Maybe kids that were like specifically our age. Yeah. Or it was like, you know, here's a game that I'm seeing on TV that if I've got a quarter, I can go down to 7-Eleven and play the same game and maybe beat the score on the TV show. That is correct. Yeah. That is correct. And if so, I could go and play on Starcade. Uh, right. The series was f first, first hosted by Mark Richardson. Jeff Edwards replaced Richardson after the first 23 shows and continued until the show's ca cancellation. Jeff Edwards, who was basically just an actor, when he got on, he decided that he would delve into the culture because he thought it was fascinating. So Jeff Edwards eventually becomes a proponent of video games um, later on, which I always thought was Kind of lovely. Uh, Starcade was produced by JM Production Company to air on WTBS and later syndicated by Turner Program Services. Starcade was the first video game show and set the blueprint for similar game shows like Video Power, Nick Arcade, and Arena. The show was used to sponsor and showcase brand new coin operated machines of the golden age of arcade video games. Shortly after the series cancellation, a second JM produced video of arcade game show. The video game was aired for a brief period from 84 to 85. <clears throat> Excuse me. So how the show played out, each round began with a video arcade game related toss-up question. The player who buzzed in and answered correctly chose one of the five freestanding arcade games in the studio and was given 40 seconds, later 60, and then 50 to amass a, as high a score as possible. The opponent then played the same game, and whatever points the player earned were added to their overall scores. If a player's game ended before time ran out, the turn ended immediately, and the player was credited with whatever points they had earned. The second and third rounds were played identically with 40 seconds, later 50 second games, playing time for the second round, and 30 seconds uh, for the third. 
Once a game was chosen for play in any round, it could not be chosen again. Uh, at the end of the second round and third, when the series began, the player in the lead players named the game attempted to identify four arcade games by viewing short clips of, of the screen, and the player won a prize for correctly identifying at least three of the games, with a second prize awarded for correctly naming all four. When teams played, both players had to play one game each in each in round one. Of the five games, there was the mystery game, which awarded a prize originally 500 extra points in very early episodes to the player who chose it uh, of the three rounds. The player in the lead at the end of the third and final round won the game and the bonus prize and moved on to the bonus round. The player selected one of those two games that had not yet been played and was given 30 seconds to beat the average score of 20 other players on that game. If the player did so, he or she won the day's grand prize, which consisted of either a stand-up arcade machine, a home entertainment robot, a jukebox, or even a vacation in certain invitational episodes. I realize that's a lot of information, but basically how it boiled down was if you were really, really good, you got to take an arcade machine home with right. you. Yeah, that was that was the the really cool thing about the show and why I wanted to be on there on there so that, bad. That that's the takeaway. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's the takeaway of that. And I don't think I don't think I've told this story before, but since we're talking about video games, I'll spiral off here. Please to, to say that Keith and I were obsessed with coin op video games is an understatement. Yeah, that's 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 underselling. <laughs> we spent a lot of time uh various arcades and places that had video games and things like that we would even take lunches from work where we would go somewhere that had coin ops or that was an arcade things like that no brothers snow brothers <laughs> but, the, but the ultimate sign of someone obsessed with a video game so there was a Mr. M's convenience store oh shit uh, I knew you were going to tell the story across the street from where Keith lived and they had a Xevious machine. So we're in there. It's night. And Keith is playing Xevious. And Keith is having the game of his life. He is just smacking this game around. Well, these two guys come in in trench coats. And one of them comes up to me and says, you boys need to leave now. <laughs> I'm relatively certain this place is about to get robbed. And I said, uh, Keith, we need to leave. And he smooth ignores me. And I said, <laughs> Keith, we need to leave. And he goes, no, fuck you, man. I'm having the game of my life. <laughs> I eventually have to pull him off the damn game to him cussing and screaming. And, and we leave and then go back to his house. And from the, uh, from the, the, you could get out onto the carport from his bedroom window. We sat there and watched Mr. M's get robbed as we're on the phone with the police letting him know Mr. M's was getting robbed. <laughs> That's right, because he lived right across the street. Yes. That's right, yeah. So I'm on the, uh, what was at the time, the, you know, high-tech, fancy, cordless phone. Yes. Out on the patio. Uh, <laughs> and and uh, 911, how can I help you? Hi, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm watching Mr. M get robbed across the street. <laughs> yeah so just a short story of being obsessed with video games <sighs> couldn't stop playing during a robbery yeah yeah so the two videos i have included for starcade were special episodes where they only talked about one video game one is for star wars and the other is for um dragon's lair so, so i got a question for you about that real quick yes um you mentioned uh, earlier in your description that, uh, you know, part of this show was to promote, you know, newly released video games. And mm -hmm. that makes me wonder, in, in any of your research, did you find anything saying that that show, they like teamed up with any one major manufacturer like Atari or... They Midway? did not. They yep. did not. They were getting it from everybody. Yep. Because I went back, I, I thought of that. I was like, oh, maybe they teamed up with Bally's or Williams or... Mm -hmm. No, no, they hit everybody. That's good. Yeah. I, they may have teamed up with an arcade. I didn't see anything on that. I don't think it was a – no, I don't think so. Because it, the in, it, in, it, in its heyday, it was on TBS, and they had yeah. their own sponsorships and whatnot. So. Yeah. 
but yeah, it was they had, did not team up with a specific uh, a company, which which is nice because you get a little bit of everything. You get Bally's right. and Williams and Atari and Data East and yeah. I think Se- at one point Sega was in the uh, coin out biz, weren't they? Yes. Oh yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. Hang on, uh, the the bike. Hang on was yeah. a, a Sega product. Yeah, I yeah, think we actually had the motorcycle the building that climbing game that I liked a lot. That I think was also Sega. Yeah, Sega also had uh, one of those big driving games too. Oh yeah, yeah. For a while, Sega had they they owned that whole sit down driving console. Yes, thing. Mm-hmm. yeah. Sega was 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 beating everybody with that. Um, and I think Sega is still doing co- coin op. Uh, what few coin ops come out now? I was just saying, I yeah. didn't know anybody was doing coin op. Yeah, yeah no, there's cool place, uh, called yeah. There's a cool place called Cidercade uh, here in Austin um, that you know has a, a huge game room, and I'm not sure. I, I mean, there might be a, a handful of games in that place, and this is a place that probably has a hundred games, and I bet I can count the number of games in there that are that's less than 10 years old hell maybe less than 20 years old on my fingers yeah right uh it's like they somebody might still be creating new coin op games but if they are i mean it's it's far few and far between oh yeah Yeah. it's still happening but it's there's not there's not many um yeah mostly everybody's making stuff for consoles and or pcs yep and of course, you know, we still call them coin ops, but none of them use coins anymore. No, no, they use cards. Yeah. Or, you know, you, you pay to get in and you just hit play. Right. Do you guys remember the token sale at uh, Putt-Putt? Oh, absolutely. And then you could get the coupons out of the yellow pages. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's right. You could you could clip the, the coupons out of the yellow pages to get extra tokens at the Putt-Putt. Yeah, $10, Which get you $10 so- and free, something like that. Yeah, so, so weird that that would be in the yellow pages, but okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm which down. Would, which would make us steal people's yellow pages. Yes, <laughs> oh. or at least that page. Yeah. Nobody uh, cares about that one page in a phone booth. I I loved uh, Crystal's Pizza because you got five quarters. And again, Crystal's Pizza, who was trying to keep up, basically just – bought quarters and painted one side of them red and that was their tokens but in their machines for a buck you got five quarters back it which seems like somebody would take advantage of that by just taking a whole shitload of dollar bills in and making some money and making some money off of it i think that's sure. probably why they eventually went to tokens they had to yeah I'm the kind of kid that that's exactly what I would have done. <laughs> that's the kind of shit that I would do. Yeah, but it's math and it's legal. Yeah, exactly. It's it's real currency, you know. There's that's right. Difference. Yeah, I think the only difference was they painted the – they defaced the, the heads on the quarters with uh, yeah. red paint. Right. But you roll them things up in a, you know, one of those little paper rollers and take it to the bank. They're not opening that thing up and looking at it. They don't care that they're red on one side. Yeah. Well, even 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 still, they're still legal tender. You can still see the face. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Miss Crystal's Pizza. Uh, you know that. Uh, speaking of Crystal's Pizza, it, it's the same people who also owned uh, Casa Bonita. Yeah. Trey Parker and Matt Stone have reopened the Casa Bonita that was in Colorado, and it's doing gangbusters right now. Yeah, it's um, like this this nostalgia mecca, you know, pilgrimage yes. for like people of our generation to go to this one remaining Casa Bonita that exists. Yes. Yeah, they did a South Park episode in yeah. in, in in Casa Bonita. Crazy. Yeah. There's talk that, uh, and it's grumblings. I don't know how official it is. They're talking about reopening crystals. Hmm. Just yeah. grumblings. Yeah, so I don't really trust the source like, I got it from. Like specifically the one that's on that was on Camp Bowie or White Settlement or wherever it was in the Camp West Bowie. Side. Of Col- I I figure if they open one, it'll be the original one that that stayed open until what ten years ago when they shut down uh, in Irving, because that was actually that last one was the first crystals. 
Ah, oh, interesting. Okay. Uh, I would rather them open the one on Camp Bowie because it was bigger. And that's the one I always went to. Yeah, the Camp Bowie one is the is the one that uh, I, the only one I ever went to or even saw, I think. I was well into adulthood before I knew that that was a chain. Yeah. Um, yeah, so kids, if you're out there, if you get a chance, you should look up some stuff on Crystal's Pizza. It was, it was like... Chuck E. Cheese on steroids. Yeah. <clears throat> it was the best. It was Chuck E. Cheese before Chuck E. Cheese and yes. way better. Way better. And the food was really good. Yeah. Unlike well, Chuck E. Cheese. Exactly. That would be the primary reason why it was way better. Yeah. That and the Sunday bar. Yeah. They had a Sunday bar. You could go over there and make your own. You paid a little money and you made your own little Sunday. With the hottest caramel sauce I've ever had in my life. <laughs> like fucking molten lava. It was, but it was so good. Um, hey, dude, there's still a Crystal's Pizza in Irving. No, no, no that one closed down about five, ten um, years ago. No, the web shows it opens at 11 a.m. They reopened it? Uh, it's certainly, lit. let's see if I can find what my, what the most recent review is. Uh, I don't know, it takes so me apparently a while the rumors it. were true. But yeah, it shows. Oh, oh, nope, nope. Sorry, that says it's closed. Womp. No. It's depressing me. I want crystals what? back. Why? Why you want to do that to us, Jeffrey? No, well, I, <laughs> I had to scroll down to find out it was closed. So it looked like it was open, but yeah, they kept it open until it. it like I said, I want to say it was less than ten years ago when they did it, hmm. when they finally closed it down. Um, and it was, it was the last one. It was also the first one. Hmm. I'm going to borrow this window of opportunity now. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I, I forgot what we were even talking about. We're talking about kids shows. The next show we're going to talk about is Giggle Snort Hotel. Uh, it was a syndicated children's television program, which ran for 78 episodes between 1975 and 1978. It was hosted by Bill Jackson, previously the host of several Chicago-based children's programs, including Clown Alley and BJ and the Dirty Dragon Show. That... Sorry. BJ and the Dirty <laughs> Dragon Show? That is fucking horrible. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds like a porn, BJ and yeah, the Dirty Dragon. BJ from Bill Jackson and the and character the Dirty, Dirty Dragon. Dragon. Yeah. It's a porn. Jesus. <laughs> the program was set, as the title implies, in an old hotel where Jackson's role was as a desk clerk. The program featured many of the characters from the previous show, including Dirty Dragon, The Old Professor, uh, which, Weird, The your, Old Mother which, Plum Tree. What's your porn name? Dirty Dragon? Dirty Dragon, yes. God. Dick Dastardly. I mean, Dirk Dastardly. Dick. D uh, I don't know. I'm the Dirty Dragon. <sighs> Several others were credited just for the program, such as the hotel's owner, Old Man Giggle Snort. Um, the show was widely praised uh, by critics and became one of the highest rated uh, children's shows in WLS TV history. It was syndicated in 1978, airing in several markets nationwide, as well as Canada, Italy, and Saudi Arabia, strangely enough. Jackson made a final appearance uh, for a presentation of the Museum of Broadcast Communications. Uh, Saturday morning with BJ and Dirty Dragons. <laughs> Bill Jackson's live in person one last time in December of 2009, saying this would be his last appearance as a performer. And in 1995, he donated all his original puppets to the Chicago Museum of Broadcasting. Now, he started this uh, show out as Clown Alley. Um, and uh, it was in competition with Garfield Goose and Friends, which was also on, on, on WGN. Um, Clown Alley eventually morphed into the BJ and Dirty Dragon show uh, when he introduced uh, Dirty Dragon, a gruff creature who snorted smoke and who was based on an old co-worker of Jackson's in Indianapolis. But eventually he retooled the show to be set in a hotel, and Dirty Dragon worked in the, um, in the basement of the hotel stoking the boiler. Um, do you guys remember this show at all? Vaguely. I remember the name. It's it just like uh, we were talking about earlier with the Great Space Coaster. It's like you you said the name of the show, and something in my mind went ping, but that's all I got. I don't remember the characters or the setting or any of that. 
Uh, again, I remember this show. Actually, I think the show was on later. Like, I only ever saw it when I was off of school. So I think maybe this show ran here while we were all at school. This this show was for uh, adults who shouldn't have been home from work. Maybe that's what it was. <laughs> but yeah, I remember. I mean, like the Price is Right. Yes, like <laughs> the Price is Right. But instead of the Price is Right, you could watch Giggle Store and Hotel. And he had some great puppets. And what was great is he had this thing called Weird, which was a big blob of clay. And he would move Weird around and make faces for Weird. And Weird would talk, but not in a way that you could understand. Only BJ could understand. And Blob sort of spoke like, or Weird sl- spoke like this. Does that, that not fire was any that, sense? Was it stop motion animation? No, no. He was actually moving, working on the clay blob while he was having a conversation with it. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That, that seems vaguely familiar to me. I always thought that was the coolest part. Um, but again, I, you know, it's, I remember the show being on, but I remember barely ever watching it because it was on at like 11 o'clock and I was usually at school, but I remember the theme song pretty well. I, I always seem to remember it being really enjoyable and it always ended with old man giggle snort sneezing, uh, 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 <laughs> instead of sneezing, he snorted. Hence the wow. name. Snort. Yeah. Wow. The next one I want to talk about is Danger Mouse. So he, the funny thing about Danger Mouse is I actually watched this as an adult, never as a kid. I don't know that it was out when I was a kid. I watched this as an adult because I was working security at Surgico's, which was the latex glove making factory in Arlington at the corner of 360 and 20. I, it eventually became Johnson and Johnson. Yeah. And when I had to make my rounds, there was just long periods of time in the middle of the night. It was just very boring, but somebody had a TV in there. And one time I turned it on and this show was on. And it became a staple, and it was on at like four or five o'clock in the morning. Oh yes, I don't, I don't know why it was on that that early, and 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 it, and it was funny because th- this is my memory of it. Sometimes when I would catch it was following the end of Gene Scott, which would go right into this show. And Gene Scott, for those of you who don't know, is this was this televangelist, this very opinionated evangelist that was very funny he smoked cigars and drank while on while on the show and when he would take vacations he would record his sermons but leave a lit cigar in an ashtray next to the tape recorder that they would play on tv it is the same guy who would also show like horses running through yes a... <laughs> yes gene scott but anyway so so yeah that that followed into danger mouse and i just i, I just thought danger mouse was a neat little show yeah, yeah, it, it was. Uh, I think they ran it on HBO over here for kids mm-hmm. back in the day. Uh, that's why not all of us can remember it because not everybody had cable. Um, but it was a British animated television series produced by Cosgrove Hall Films for Tim's Television, and it featured the eponymous Danger Mouse, who worked as a secret agent in a parody of British spy fiction, particularly the Danger Man series and James Bond. It originally ran from 28th of September 1981 to 19. 19- to March 19th, 1992 on ITV uh, Network. Now, Danger Mouse over here ran on syndications either, depending on when you got up, either really late at night or really early in the morning. Yeah, that's why I said it was like 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was, again, you know, I, I guess it was children's television for drunk people. <laughs> Because uh, I seem to remember watching it uh, really late at night as opposed to really early in the morning. Well, you know, I, it makes me wonder. You said we were talking uh, earlier about the uh, um, the regulations that said that there had to be so much, you know, children's or educational programming. Yes. And, and I said that that had been deregulated in the mid 80s. And you said it came back later, which I was not aware of. Mm-hmm. I wonder if that's why. Right. It's like, OK, we, we've got this you know, regulation that says that we have to fill so many hours of programming with kids programming. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Let's put it at four in the morning. Let's put it because, at four in the morning. Maybe that's we why. we can't sell that spot otherwise. Yeah. It's like, oh, yeah, we can't. Uh, paid programming won't even pick this one up. So right. <laughs> let's put it on at 4 a.m. And it was. It was on, like, I, I want to say 21 at, like, 4 a.m. Yeah, that sounds right. He's right. It was on for, like, 10 years. I, I want to say all through the 90s. My uh, my recollection about Danger Mouse, I think I only caught the show a couple of times, but uh, in high school, uh, Jeff and I had a couple of friends who, uh, a couple of, uh, you know, girl besties that they went by, their nicknames were Danger and Mouse. <laughs> and so, and that was, that was how, that was my knowledge of the show was that that was that, where that was from. Danger and Mouse. Yeah. Nice. That's kind of cool. Um, I, I don't have a lot about Danger Mouse, but I'm kind of with you. I, I only ever saw it at four o'clock in the morning. I seem to vaguely remember it, seeing it as a kid over at somebody's house, but again, I didn't have cable because I lived on the lake and they didn't offer it where I lived. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I didn't have cable because I was fucking poor. Well, that too. <laughs> <laughs> Why would we pay for TV? It's free over the air. The next show I want to talk about is Dusty's Treehouse. Shortly, uh, shortly after graduating from California State College, Long Beach, uh, Bill Rosen got work as production assistant at KCET. He wrote and starred in the TV series Dusty's Treehouse from 1968 to 1980. Um, Rosen voice directed many cartoons and commercials for television, including Mask, Hulk Hogan's Rock and Wrestling, Fraggle Rock, uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, The Legend of Prince Valiant, Super Secret Squirrel, uh, and segments of Two Stupid Dogs and Biker Mice from Mars. I loved Fraggle Rock. Yeah, other shows uh, followed Batman the Animated Series, uh, Pirates of Dark Water, X-Men, Spider-Man. This guy was in animation for a long time, but he got a start on this little children's show. I'm sorry, I said Bill. It's actually uh, Stuart. Stuart Rosen, um, and it featured the puppets of Tony Urbano. Uh, while mainly airing on local series, the show premiered nationally in the fall of 1975. Rosen was the creator and co-executive producer and based it on a program titled Dusty's Attic, which he developed and aired from 66 to 67 on KCET, then a uh, NET station for Los Angeles. Um, we should probably explain that. So originally PBS was called National, Inter uh, National Education uh, Television. Uh, but in the late 60s, early 70s, they moved it over to public broadcast television um, and then set up the endowments for PBS, which they kept trying to strip away. Again, as Keith discussed, in the 80s. Um, but I think one station in New York – or I'm sorry, one station in Pittsburgh kept the NET name, which is where we got um, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Um, but this particular show, Dusty's Treehouse, um, which was in Los Angeles, it was in a traditional style similar to Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood and Captain Kangaroo. Uh, Dusty Rosen and his amazing custom-built treehouse uh, where anything and everything could happen. Often, Dusty had conversations with his puppet animal friends, including Maxine the Crow, Scooter the Squirrel, and Stanley the Red-Haired Spider in Sneakers. Dusty also went on tree trips, uh, which were field trips via balloon and basket, to factories to see how puppets were made, or to parks, zoos, aquariums, and so on. Other puppets and shadow puppets uh, enacted a classic fairy tales, too, including Cinderella, Beauty and the Beast, Puss in Boots, and The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Topics included school performances, politics, music, behavior versus misbehavior, kindness, and other good health habits, asking for help, or even being careful uh, for what you wish for. In an episode where Maxine magically becomes an ear of corn, Scooter becomes a walnut, Stanley becomes an apple, and Dusty disappears. Jokes, songs, and comics antics ensued, but always with a moral lesson to be learned. Sometimes a serious topic was tackled, ranging from Stanley coping with the death of his pet goldfish to Scooter being hit by a car for chasing a baseball into traffic. Holy shit! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Dusty's treehouse was rough. <laughs> I always remember at, at the end of the episode, he would always talk to this little worm puppet, which was clearly a guy with a 
with his finger through a little puppet, you know, through a hole in a barrel. But the finger puppet was so expressive. As a small child, I remember it thinking, oh, wow, that is the coolest thing. I wish I could live in a magical treehouse and talk to a worm. <laughs> but uh, uh, this is one of the ones that, um, as a kid, I always, it stuck in my brain. And no one else remembers this show. This was actually, this show was the impetus for making this episode. It's like, nobody remembers the show. I don't know anybody can say Dusty's Treehouse, and everybody's like, what the hell was that? They can remember New Zoo Review. They can remember The Electric Company and Zoom, maybe a little. Giggle Snort Hotel, things like that. No one remembers Dusty's Treehouse. Well, I start talking about – I was just going to say, you know, we've hit on this throughout the episode about how many of these shows were originally uh, broadcast by some regional PBS station, which is why – some people, it's like like Captain Kangaroo, which I think you mentioned a minute ago, right? Yes. Captain Kangaroo was like a, a crucial part of my early childhood. But yes. that's another show that I feel like, you know, sometimes you'll make some reference to Captain Kangaroo and people will be like, who? You know, What is Captain Kangaroo? Yeah, and I feel like Captain Kangaroo was eventually picked up by like ABC or something. So yeah. it was definitely a national show. Yeah, Captain uh, Kangaroo was on every... Well, on every television state or every television set in America in the late sixties and up through I want to say the early eighties. Yeah. It was so, on everywhere. Yeah. So maybe that's a shitty example. But <laughs> my my point is is that there's a, a lot of these shows that were only ever broadcast or syndicated regionally, mm-hmm. uh, you know, or for a short time or in the middle of the night. Right. <laughs> At four o'clock in the morning. Yeah, and and so you know that's why uh, I'm guessing at least half of these shows on your list have like this very patchy sort of you know patchwork level of recognition among people our generation. Exactly, which is why I've included full episodes in our YouTube playlist so people can go back and see them, and maybe they can kind of remember these things. Most oh. of this stuff was educational um, that I was looking for because I, I thought maybe maybe we need to talk about again, as you said. The deregulation of education, uh, educational television, which has come back into force in, I want to say, the early 2000s was when it came back because that's basically when the Saturday morning cartoons went away. Um, The next and final show I want to talk about is Pinwheel. Pinwheel uh, was an American children's television series and the first to air on Nickelodeon as well as the first to appear on Nick Jr. Block. The show was aimed at preschoolers aged three to five. It was created by Vivian Horner, an educator who spent her earliest career at the Children's Television Workshop, the company behind Sesame Street Electric Company, as we spoke of before. The show was geared to the short attention span of preschoolers, with each episode divided into short, self-contained segments, including songs, skits, and animation. The series is set in a boarding house called Pinwheel House, which is powered by a pinwheel on the roof. The house residents are a mix of live-action humans and puppets. Most of the show's songs are set to music in the style of a wind-up music box. Pinwheel premiered on December 1st, 1977 on Channel C3 of Cubes, a local cable system in Columbus, Ohio. In April 1979, Channel C3 expanded into a national television network now called Nickelodeon. Pinwheel continued to air on the network until 1990, and from 1988 to 1990, Pinwheel was aired exclusively during the then Nick Jr. block. It was gradually phased out in favor of another preschool series, Eureka's Castle. Um, Eureka's Castle is a successor series to Pinwheel. But it was started in this... So this local uh, cable provider in Columbus, Ohio, uh, wanted to develop a children's series, uh, and they got in bed with the Children's Television Network and they called it Cube, Q-U-B-E. Do you and really have to use the expression got in bed with when we're talking about children's television? Yes. Yes, I do. <laughs> in a creative sense, they got in bed with. Um, and they developed this in this little local, local Columbus area and basically tested it out. Uh, and they figured out that they could do a cable channel geared towards television or uh, children. And they called it Nickelodeon. 
And the first show they ran was um, Pinwheel. As a matter of fact, uh, Pinwheel was the only show they aired for the longest time. Nickelodeon would come on, it'd be eight hours of Pinwheel, and then you can't do that on television, and then eight more hours. <laughs> See, and of I remember pinwheel. you can't do that on television, but I uh, that was a Canadian show, but mm-hmm. I don't remember Pinwheel at all. Oh, yeah, Pinwheel. Um, it was most of their programming for the first three or four years that uh, Nickelodeon was on the air. Huh. Uh, especially during the day. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, it was, it was a, it was a big part of a lot of kids' childhood. Not so much mine. Again, didn't have cable. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so I couldn't really see it. I, I would watch it occasionally. I'd go over to a friend's house and it'd be on and be like, oh, wow, that's cool. Oh, it's like Sesame Street. Oh, that's cool. That was what I thought about Fraggle Rock. Uh, I believe Fraggle Rock was originally originally aired on HBO. It which was, was correct. It was. And uh, and I remember being a kid and being angry that this show made by the same people who made Sesame Street, I couldn't watch because it's on some channel that's not free. And, that's right. You know, but even, you couldn't even get as a Yeah, even as like a nine-year-old or however old I was at that time, I was infuriated by capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> Is Fraggle Rock on Max? I, I think to, so. I need to look. I'm gonna. I'm gonna I think look. they're actually even talk about bringing it back if they haven't done so already. Let's see, Fraggle Rock. Fraggle Rock. Um, no. How oh, interesting. I I figure they would have Fraggle Rock on Max. That's interesting that it's not. Huh. But there is Scooby Doo and Kiss, a rock and roll mystery. Rock yes. on! Oh man, I remember that. Rock on! I don't like Scooby Doo, but I may have to watch that. You go check that out, man. <clears throat> and report back because yes. I'm not going to watch it again. Wow! <laughs> One of the well, it can't be as bad as Phantom of the Park. <sighs> One of those many things that you know we we fondly remember from our childhood, and if you go back and do it now and and rewatch it now, you'll just ruin it. So just yeah, don't. Maybe, go do it. Maybe. Yeah. <clears throat> Star Wars holiday special. <clears throat> so oh, I, mad that my parents turned that off, and I could never realize why. And then I eventually saw it years later, and I thought, oh yeah, I know that makes sense. <laughs> You know that there's a there's a whole series of uh, Lego video games based on the Star Wars franchise. Yeah. Yes. Did you know that there is a Lego Star Wars holiday special? Yep. Yes, there is, and it's awesome. Because yep. <laughs> they make fun of it too. Of course they do. I mean, that's its cultural impact, right? As like this was the most early, you know, the most poorly conceived poorly performed holiday special ever put on ever broadcast on television in the history of the world. Yeah. That's its legacy. Yep. And George Lucas wants to disavow all knowledge of it. Yeah. Well, it's like Highlander too. It doesn't exist. (laughs) What? Nothing. (laughs) So that's it. That's the 10 episodes I wanted to discuss, or the 10 series I wanted to discuss in this episode. Awesome. Thank you guys for going down that path with me. Um, Oh, it was excellent. Thank you for bringing it. Sure. Absolutely. I absolutely appreciate that that journey. So with that, then, we'll step over to the dark side of the house with our murder of this week. The murder. Uh, transition in some cases like this yeah so for this week I got my information off the stay at home mom the daily telegraph vocal academic dictionaries and encyclopedias and the herald sun and this is the story of Ebony Jane Simpson Ebony James Simpson so it was a case that captivated uh, the nation because it struck a chord for all parents with a busy schedule and young children. Ebony Jane Simpson was the daughter of Christine and Peter Simpson. She had two brothers, Zach and Taz. 
and they had moved to Bargo, which is a small country town in New South Wales, about 100 kilometers south of Sydney, 11 years before. I'm sorry, did you say Taz? Yes. <laughs> okay. Yep. And they're Australian. Yep. Okay, yeah, they are in Australia, so okay. Oh, yeah. Fair. Uh, they had renovated an old farmhouse and had a beautiful, comfortable home in the country. <clears throat> On the 19th of August, 92, Christine and Peter were running late to pick up their, their only daughter, Ebony, from the rural bus stop. The usual routine was for Ebony to meet her mom a few, a few meters away from the school bus stop. Uh, the couple had been caught in traffic, and Christine called home and spoke to her son, Zach, to see if he might have caught the same bus. But Zach told his mom they had caught different buses that day and that his took an alternate route home. But Zach hadn't seen Ebony. Christine then asked Zach to go to get on his bike and go to the bus stop uh, that was located at the corner of Bargo Road and Arena Road to see if Ebony was still there waiting. Uh, the bus stop was only 400 meters away from their home, but Ebony wasn't there. Uh, Zach did call his parents to let them know, and Christine had a nagging feeling that something wasn't right, so she hurried home. In the weeks prior, Ebony had been trying to ask her parents to allow her to walk the 400 meters home from the bus stop, but Christine wasn't thrilled about this idea and insisted that she or her husband, Peter, pick, uh, pick her up or that she caught the bus with her brother. Christine did get home a few minutes later, and she looked on the veranda to see if Ebony's shoes were located where she usually left them, but they weren't there. And then Peter called all of Ebony's friends to see if, uh, if maybe a friend's parents may have picked up Ebony, but nobody had seen her. Christine and Peter, luckily, uh, thankfully, didn't hesitate, and they called the police right away. Police soon arrived at the home of the Simpsons, began to question the couple, asking if possible that Ebony had run away. The Simpsons insisted that Ebony wasn't the, that type of kid, and it was unusual for her to not be waiting at the bus stop. The police did search the home, though, and the Simpsons started searching the area, and they called family to come and help. Uh, approximately 100 people, including police, firemen, and members of the state emergency services and volunteers started looking for Ebony in the area. There was even a police helicopter that was engaged to look for uh, the girl over the vast rural area. Police started to intently interrogate Peter, who was offended that he had anything to do with his daughter's disappearance, though. At 8.30 p.m., a local teenage boy approached the searchers, advising that he had seen Ebony walking home along the side of the road towards her house, and he had noticed a car parked on the side of the road not far from where Ebony was walking. The boy took police to where he had seen Ebony, and the vehicle was still located there. It was a dirty yellow, yellow Mazda 808 that was parked with its hood up and the trunk open. At 10 p.m., police re released Peter from questioning so he could join the search for Ebony, but no one could find her. The search continued early into the next morning, but police continued to interrogate Peter and Christine. They asked about family circumstances or any fight that may have occurred or any reason why Ebony might not want to come home. They, and then they asked about if they had noticed anyone suspicious in the area. When Christine remembered about a week before, she had noticed a cream or yellow car on the side of the road that looked like it had broken down with a man leaning over the hood. Christine said, quote, I remember seeing a guy in a broken down car with its bonnet open the other way around, which is different from other cars. I remember looking at him, looking at him and thinking, I'll pick up Ebony up and then I'll come back around to see if I can help him. That night, Christine did have a talk, uh, a talk with Ebony about stranger danger and that you shouldn't be rude to strangers, but you should be sensible. Christine did describe the man next to the yellow car. She described him as 8 to 20 years old, a medium build with shoulder-length, mousy brown hair and a mustache. Police conducting the search were speaking to each other about the sighting of the, of the man when a vehicle that matched Christine's description of the car was, was noticed parked not far from where the police were talking. The car was parked with others who were assisting in the search of Ebony. And the police ran the plates, and they came to a man named Andrew Garforth, who was an unemployed laborer with a de facto wife and three little children. Police looked over the vehicle and noticed that it was strikingly clean inside and out for an older style, older style, style vehicle, clean as, as if it had been meticulously detailed. A police check on Andrew Garforth revealed that he had a criminal history of theft and driving, driving misdemeanors and police waited at the vehicle for Andrew to return, and when he did, they took him to the station. 
Meanwhile, police took Christine and Peter to the location of the vehicle to see if this was the same one Christine had witnessed the previous week, and she believed it was. So they then took the, the, the car to the police station for further investigation. At 5.30 p.m. that afternoon, police started to forensically search Andrew's vehicle. They also decided to search Andrew's home for any possible sold clothing. Police did ask the public for anyone that cited a dirty yellow car in the vicinity on the day of Ebony's murder to speak up, and the Simpsons' neighbor, Iris Proctor, had seen such a vehicle driving up and down the road where Ebony's bus stop was on the day of her murder. Fresh blood was located in the trunk of, of Andrew's vehicle, and he was now their top suspect, and they, which they brought him in for questioning. He denied any involvement in Ebony's disappearance. He said he had tried. He he had helped to try and find her. And why would he do anything if he had if he had anything to do with her going missing? There Cover. was, uh, yeah, exactly. <clears throat> there was blood in the trunk, and he put it down to being from a sheep's carcass. But what he couldn't explain was the small child's handprint found by investigators right behind the wheel well of the boot of the car. Huh. Knowing he was caught, Andrew explained that the young girl was walking on the road and passed his car when he grabbed her and put her vi- and, and violently put her, put her into the trunk of his car. And police said that Andrew was speaking so casually that they were shocked. He said he then drove to a wildlife reserve seven kilometers down the road, weighted her school bag down with rocks, and threw her into the dam where she drowned. Police then rushed to the dams if there was, in case there were any hopes to find Ebony still alive. And it was midnight when police shone their headlights over the dam on the beaten track where Andrew had directed them. Floating in the light was a pink lunchbox. Two police officers volunteered to wade into the freezing dam to try to find Ebony. And after 20 minutes, they felt something in the, in the water. And unfortunately, it was the body of Ebony Simpson and she had no signs of life. At 4 a.m. on Friday, August 21st, 92, Christine uh, Simpson saw a police car arrive at her home. She screamed when she found out that her young daughter had passed, and Christine later said, quote, two young constables came to the front door and told me they had found her body. I just fell to the floor. I cried and begged to let them to, to, to them to let me hold her, that maybe if I held her, I could bring her back to life. Uh, Andrew was uh, sent to court for later that day. And over 200 locals hurled abuse at him as he, uh, for being responsible for Ebony's death. Details of the crime, when they came to light, were even more horrific than anyone could have imagined. Andrew laid in wait for Ebony just down the road from the bus, and he had been watching her for a few weeks. On that particular day, when there were no signs of her parents picking her up or her brother accompanying her, he pounced. He bundled her roughly into the trunk of his car and then drove to the remote dam where he bound her hands and feet with wire, repeatedly sexually assaulted her, and then weighed her down to the school with the school bag, which he tied to her feet, and then threw her into the cold water to drown. And he then ho- drove home to his wife and three sons. The next morning, news of Ebony's disappearance was everywhere, and Andrew's wife insisted he go out and help for her, so he went and joined the volunteers in the hunt for Ebony, but he showed absolutely no remorse for his crime. Andrew was eventually sentenced to life imprisonment. His papers were ordered to be marked, quote, never to be released after Judge Peter Newman declined to set a non-parole period. The case was described by Newman as being the worst category, in the worst category, joining only four other cases in the New South Wales entire history. Uh, Andrew is serving his imprisonment at the Goldberg Jail, and he will die in prison. His prison hasn't been an easy time. He's been attacked by other inmates, including an attack by a group of 10 inmates in October of 93, resulting in bruises, a cut to his eyes, and blows to the back of his leg and back, and he was also repeatedly kicked while on the ground. A spokesman for the Department of Corrective Services said he's considered by other prisoners prisoners to be at the bottom of the criminal hierarchy, which they call a rock spider or child molester, and I believe that's the same thing here in the States. Yeah. Yeah, you don't want that getting out if you're in jail. Right. Uh, Andrew is also suspected in the unsolved murder of Western Australian teenager Felicia Felicia Marie Wilson. On the 7th of December, 1994, uh, Andrew appealed his sentence in the high court, stating that he was only 29 at at the age of his crime, so he should be able to apply for parole after a certain period. The high court of Australia rejected uh, Andrew's request for special leave despite his appeal. 
and there were two other situations like it in which special leave was denied. In discussing the meaning of life imprisonment, which to me means life, the judges stated when Andrew challenged his verdict, quote, the community interest in retribution, deterrence, protection of children and community in such situations may so strongly outweigh any regard for rehabilitation that a life sentence becomes the only option. Uh, with his attorneys, Andrew has filed a number of claims for compensation for victims in 95 in connection with alleged assault that allegedly took place in prison. And in 2015, Andrew applied to the Serious Offenders Review Council to lower his prisoner classification from A2, which is maximum security, to B, which is medium security, so that he may, it may apply for work, rehabilitation courses, and television in his cell. The Simpson family rallied and gathered 30,000 signatures and presented the, these to Corrective Services Minister David Elliott, and so his original A2 status remains. As we had talked about that Andrew is suspected in the murder of Felicia Wilson, uh, she was an Australian teenager uh, who was 19 of Kiwana, Perth. She was a former West, Miss West Coast finalist. She was stripped naked and slashed before her killer smashed her skull with a, with, with a block of limestone as she walked home from work at the Kiwana Community Health Center about 4.30 p.m. on the 10th of January, 1979. The manhunt went cold until the early 90s when WA executive, detectives received information from the New South Wales police about a man who reportedly had nightmares about the victim. By 1994, New South Wales police had further information about Wilson's death that linked Garforth, who lived in the area at the time, to an unsolved crime, but that investi investigation is still ongoing. The Murder Victim Support Group was founded in collaboration between the parents of Anita Cobby, who was murdered in New South Wales in 86, Grace and Larry Lynch, and Simpson's parents, Peter and Christine Simpson, the group advocates for victims' rights and offers assistance to the relatives of murder victims. And in December of 95, the Simpsons opened the Ebony House, which is a two-bedroom uh, cottage surrounded by bushland that's a recovery center where people affected by homicide can go and, es and escape from everyday life. Uh, the couple does plan on opening a similar rehabilitation center for children affected by a homicide. It's really sad that they have to even have that. Yeah. And that is the story of Ebony Jane Simpson. Well, thank you, sir. That was an interesting tale. A terrible one. Yeah. Terrible one at that. Minor, minor never light. No. no. I, I will say this. I, I, I find it refreshing that they were basically on this guy day two. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That, that, that's great versus cases we've covered before where we've gone years, decades, mm -hmm. You yeah. know, with, without without uh, any they, them getting anyone or a suspect or anything like that. So yeah, it's it's always refreshing when they get them so quick. Uh, that happened with the um, oh, and her name is escaping me now. Uh, Sarah Sarah Joggin. You know, yes. they had him like day one or day two. Yeah, day one or day two. Yeah. So. Awesome. Well, I appreciate that, Keith. Thank you again for joining us. We very much appreciate the guestery. Yes. Thank you. Happy to be here. Awesome. Thanks awesome. Yes. Anytime, anytime you want to be on, just let us know. We're happy. Oh, yeah. We're happy to have you on. Uh, with that, that'll take us to the end of another week of nerdery and murdery. As always, you can find uh, our website at nerdery and .com. That's our hub where you find more information, uh, links to the things we, that we've talked about pictures, uh, as well as a link to our YouTube page that Zig so often updates. Yes, yes, we have a we have an episode or, or a, a playlist for every episode, uh, including this one, uh, and we will eventually re re put this video in that playlist once it airs, so you can see our faces and, and Keith's cat. Our faces that are meant for radio. Yes, face for radio, baby. Uh, you can also find the link to our merchandise page where if you wish to show off your nerdery and murdery fandom, please do consider uh, purchasing something there. And you can also find the link to our Patreon where if you wish to be to donate to the show be, and become a patron, please do consider that. Those do uh, help the costs of keeping the show on the air as there are costs associated with them. It does not go to fuel our missing Lamborghinis, our missing vacations, and our missing mansions. 
Please and thank you. Please and thank you. Last but not least, please don't forget to leave a five-star review wherever you can. It helps us and helps others find our show that may be looking for content that we're putting out there. So with that, I have been Zig with your nerdery. And I'm Jeffrey with your murdery. Cue the music. <laughs> <laughs>